Welcome to episode six of the Oregon Family Law Guy podcast. I'm the Oregon Family Law Guy, Hansery LaForest. And as always, we are seeking to empower Oregonians everywhere by discussing the ins and outs of Oregon family law. Today is August 12th, 2018. Weather has gotten a bit cooler this weekend. We are now in the 80s. Uh, there was some rain yesterday, uh, which is good. It was uh, really a hot couple of days there at the end from Wednesday to Friday. I mean, it hit upper 90s. And uh, again, I'm telling everyone uh, that I feel like I brought the heat from Dallas up with me. But So it was a nice respite uh, to get a little bit of cooler weather. It looks like we're going into a yo-yo effect now with the weather. Uh, it looks like during the week, it's supposed to shoot right back up into the 90s and then probably cool down towards the end of the week. So looking forward to some consistently cool weather, but uh, you never know. Some housekeeping stuff. Uh, our website is live, so that's some good news. I was just able to get the website up and running last night so for you folks listening if you go to oregonfamilylawguy.com uh, type all of that in there uh, you'll be able to see the website see all our content uh, we've got both the uh, podcast episodes the prior podcast episodes in addition to uh, the explainer videos. I use uh, explainer videos in the plural because we also posted a second explainer video up last night. Um, the audio quality isn't as great on that second video as I would have liked. By the way, that second video is on FAPA orders and FAPA hearings, FAPA standing for uh, Family Abuse Prevention Act, and these are the sorts of orders that one goes to court and gets. Uh, whenever there's a domestic violence or domestic abuse type situation they're they're essentially restraining orders and um, in that video i explain uh, what's going on with the restraining orders um, so take a look when you get a chance uh, listen to it comment on it uh, if i get enough people uh, commenting about uh, the audio quality i may have to adjust that or redo the recording on that but it's up and running uh, all of that is on the website. We still have the YouTube channel up. We still have uh, the Facebook channel up. So you can also uh, follow up on those on on those mediums as well. Um, but you can always go to the website now, OregonFamilyLawGuy.com, and get the content there. Today we are talking about paternity disputes, uh, and specifically we're talking about the process for bringing up uh, a paternity suit, uh, how a mother, child or uh, the government can pursue a declaration of paternity and whether or not someone can contest paternity. C can contest paternity. The reason why I decided to go with this topic is because I saw a question uh, the other day from an individual asking, um, it, you know, felt kind of bad for this individual, uh, but, you know, looks like they were in an intimate relationship with another person. That person ended up getting pregnant. Uh, apparently, uh, this individual's finances are not in a state where you know they could really afford a child and the question was whether or not they can compel um, someone to get an abortion the answer to that is no by the way I'll, I'll tell you that up front I, I don't think I'm ruining uh, the surprise ending here by telling you you can't do that but I'm gonna get into why you can't do that and uh, just the process in general uh, and some of the things that uh, one can do depending on which side you fall on. First of all, let's talk about why this is a big deal. Um, this should be obvious, but obviously children are a big deal. Uh, children have uh, lots of different consequences, not just uh, socially, uh, financially, but we're also talking legally. We're talking about obligations on a parent uh, to provide uh, child support. Um, we're talking about child custody obligations obligations for that one parent or for both parents sometimes that have the children um, to have a say in that children's upbringing to have a say in that child's life uh, to have a say in uh, where that child goes to school where that child um, chooses to worship if you know the child and the parents are so inclined uh, religiously uh, but there are those sorts of obligations uh, there's inheritance consequences uh, for specifically if you know there's a declaration of paternity so uh, we're talking about 
um, you know, where if someone passes away, uh, where the property goes to under intestacy laws, which, you know, there's a topic for, you know, another day and quite frankly, another podcast. Social security consequences, tax consequences, tax credits. Um, these are all things that whenever there is a declaration of paternity or someone is rec uh, recognized as the father or mother of a child, uh, these are the all things that come into play. So the way our law is structured here in this country and in the state of Oregon, uh, there's a tremendous amount of consequences and a tremendous amount of responsibility that the law imputes whenever there's a declaration of paternity or someone is adjudicated to be a father. The reason why I phrase it like this is because there is a difference between being the father or mother of someone biologically versus someone being uh, the legal father or the legal dad. And, you know, you may be asking me, well, you know, what's the difference between a bio biological dad and a legal dad? Well, here's the difference. You can have someone actually be the biological father of a child, okay? But the court decides for one reason or another reason to recognize someone else as the legal father. It could be for a wide variety of different reasons, and it could come up in a wide variety of different circumstances. For example, let's say you have the unfortunate situation uh, where someone is listed as birth dad on the birth certificate. Uh, that person assumes that they're the birth dad uh, all throughout um, the child's life, and for whatever reason, they find out later on that they are not, in fact, birth dad, but, you know, someone else is actually birth dad. It's a pretty unfortunate circumstance, but a lot of times, and you'll see in a lot of cases, not just here in the state of Oregon, but elsewhere, um, if that ever goes to court or, you know, that person decides to challenge that, um, you know, a lot of times the court can turn around and, and declare someone the legal father. Uh, of that child, even though they're not the biological father. Um, to some, it may seem unfair, but there's a reason why the court would be interested in doing that. It's the idea of stability for a child. If a child grows up uh, his or her entire life believing um, that someone is their father and also receiving support from that individual, the courts and the laws sometimes find it unfair uh, to change that support mechanism. The court will say like, well, for all intents and purposes, you are the father of that child in a legal sense. It's the same concept as adoption, right? Like, you know, when you have an adoption proceeding and someone decides to take on a child, well, that's a legal proceeding. That's the, the court bestowing on a person the legal title of a parent of a child. Uh, that doesn't deal with biology, but it's much along the same lines. It's the same concept of the court bestowing a title upon uh, a particular uh, party, a uh, particular father or mother or what have you, as being the biological, uh, as being the uh, legal uh, representative and the legal person in charge of that particular child. So that's a key distinction that you want to keep in mind. There, there are plenty of instances in which you could conceivably have a biological father, uh, but the legal father uh, would be someone that's uh, completely different. So what is the process? Well, let's say that you have a situation where uh, a mother wants to, for whatever reason, have a declaration that a particular individual is the father or a particular individual is the parent of a child. What they're going to do is they're going to, you know, bring up a paternity suit, which is called affiliation proceeding in the state of Oregon. Okay. Now, who can, you know, basically bring uh, these particular sorts of proceedings? Well, for obviously, the mother of a child can bring that proceeding, uh, or a pregnant mom if the child is still, um, is, hasn't been born just yet. Um, the child can also bring that proceeding through a guardian or a guardian ad litem. That's uh, basically a, uh, a phrase for a guardian designated by the court to represent the interests of the child. Um, the father himself or, you know, can also bring that proceeding, uh, especially in cases when um, the father may be the one that's trying to assert paternity. A lot of times, uh, and I'm dealing with a case right now, uh, where you've got a dispute and, and the mother's trying to say, well, you know, the, you are not the father of the child, but the, but the father himself 
uh, wants to assert a paternity over that child. Well, they'll also bring uh, a paternity suit, a paternity action, affiliation action uh, to assert those rights. Uh, and finally, uh, you can also have the government. The state government can also bring that sort of proceeding. Uh, usually, it's done through the child support administrator of the Department of Justice. So if there's ever a situation where they want to assert child support uh, and one person is maybe contesting that or there's never been a declaration of paternity, there's no one that's listed on the birth certificate, um, the DOJ will oftentimes bring uh, the suit uh, itself. What's the sort of evidence that they're going to look to in these sort of proceedings? Well, uh, a paternity test is the most important piece of evidence that you're going to have in any affiliation proceeding because a paternity test, um, when done right, when put in front of a court, creates a presumption of paternity when positive. It also works the other way. A paternity test can also create a presumption of non-paternity uh, when it's negative, when it shows that the person who was tested is not the father of a child. Um, so that's some of the, you know, really in modern times going to be the most persuasive evidence in these sorts of cases. You can also um, have a situation where you don't do a paternity test, where you just do it on affidavits. Um, by and large, though, I think that's um, that's been avoided. Uh, the, the, the science with the paternity test uh, and the reliability of the paternity tests make it such that that's really going to be the critical pieces of evidence in a case. Now, are there defenses against paternity? There are a few. There, there, there really aren't that many, okay? You can't really force someone, as I mentioned at the top of the show, to terminate a pregnancy. That's, that, that's not going to happen. You know, the law recognizes that a person has a right, you know, if they are carrying a child, to, to give birth to that child. Um, you also can't rely on as a defense that the other person maybe tricked you into thinking that they were using contraception um, uh, to not get pregnant uh, and then you know they ended up not using the contraception so you know I've seen cases where they're just like well you know what if you know the the mom or something like that uh, said that they were you know going to be using birth control and they or they were using an IUD and they didn't uh, in fact use that and now we have a situation where uh, there's a, a, there's a child well you can't really rely on that as a defense there are no cases as far as I could find in the state of Oregon uh, where someone has asserted that defense to any degree of success that's that's just not gonna happen now if the disputed father okay wants to avoid paternity and the mother agrees what can they do okay can they sign some sort of contract they could you know uh, technically they could enter into some sort of agreement where if both of the parties here just want to say for whatever reason um, hey you know father does you know uh, is is not going to be the legal father of a child and in no way will a mother attempt to uh, assert the paternity or, ch or uh, assert paternity on the father uh, they could try to get that signed and present it to court uh, but it's up to the court to decide whether or not to accept that okay and and here's the reason why um, a contract that's made between a mother and a father uh, you know especially when you have a child that's not born of a marriage or anything like that if there's no judicial scrutiny of that okay and no court approval that's not going to preclude a later party uh, from then trying to assert paternity so in other words you know you can have this contract okay but if the someone decides like let's say the mother decides hey i changed my mind you know for child support reasons or for other reasons uh i want a declaration of paternity on this particular person or maybe the guardian of the child decides uh that they want to go ahead and do that for the benefit of a child um a court may be free to revisit that uh, there's a case out there for you folks that are listening called fox v hohenschelt uh, I know I butchered that. I apologize, but it's uh, H is in Harry, O is in Oscar, H is in Harry, E is in Eric, N is in Nicholas, S is in Sam, H is in Harry, E is in Eric, L is in Larry, T is in Tom. So it's Hohenschelt, 
and that's 19 Oregon Appeal 617. It's a 1974 case where they basically say just that. Hey, you know, you've got a contract between the mother, you've got and the the father. Okay, the child is born. It's outside of a, a marriage. Um, there is no judicial scrutiny or court approval of that. Okay. Either one of those parents in that case, uh, this is what the court is saying, either one of those parents uh, could have initiated a future affiliation proceeding, okay? So if the mother decides that she wants to challenge because she wants child support or the child has a guardian that wants to challenge, maybe the father decides that he wants to turn around and challenge it. The court may decide to overturn it. So what does that mean? I'm not saying that you can't have some sort of agreement. OK, you can have some sort of agreement and the, it's going to be in the court's discretion whether or not to recognize that agreement, uh, taking into account the financial circumstance of the situation, uh, financial circumstances of both parents, whether or not if there is a, a non-paternity sort of a finding on the record um, that whether or not the mother is able to maintain. OK, uh, if the court decides, hey, we're going to recognize this agreement is non-paternity, you can do that, but just keep in mind um, that should any party decide to challenge that in the future, um, that may be something that the court may revisit. So with that being said, uh, that's the end of our discussion on paternity here in the state of Oregon. Um, key points that I want you guys to leave with, uh, like, comment, and subscribe. Please go to OregonFamilyLawGuy.com if you have any questions. This show is going to be posted on there. Um, if you have any concerns or questions about it, uh, there's a comment section that allows you to comment, and I'll get back to you. I'm very interested to hear uh, what you guys have to say about this. If you guys disliked the information, if you guys really didn't like any of this information, or, or you... You know, you have a bone to pick about what was said on this show. I want to hear from you as well. Um, so please don't hesitate to reach out. You can find us on YouTube. You can find us on the website now. You can also find us on Facebook and on iTunes as usual. So uh, like, comment, and subscribe. Uh, that's going to conclude our 